On this week's 51%, we speak with gender expert Kate Mangino about her new book, Equal Partners, and how couples can better balance household work and promote gender equality at home. Our perception and our reality isn't quite aligned, and we are giving the illusion that we've reached equality when we all know in our individual households we haven't. We still have this statistic that the female role is handling twice as much work in the home as the male role. I'm Jesse King. It's all up next on 51%. I was standing around like one of those girls I had seen in a movie The whole world was a movie back then I had my sunglasses on, I wanted to be seen without seeing Shiloh or Lita, I wasn't really in it I didn't really get it You're listening to 51%, a WAMC production dedicated to women's issues and experiences. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Jesse King. Our main guest today is a self-described gender expert. For two decades, Kate Mangino has been working with international organizations to promote gender equality and address issues like forced marriages, domestic violence, and overall toxic masculinity in more than 20 countries. Here in the U.S., at least, the mainstream discussion around gender is changing beyond the gender binary. But as Mangina will tell us, the ways gender plays out at home are still largely traditional. For example, women are more likely to work and have their own careers, sure, but they're still burdened with the majority of housework and child care. Even among LGBTQ couples, Mangino says the relationship dynamics we build can be largely uneven or unequal. Mangino hopes to change that. In her new book, Equal Partners, Improving Gender Equality at Home, she offers plenty of tips, stories, and interviews for couples looking to level the playing field, or at least find the dynamic that works best for them. It's important to note before we start, and Mangino makes this clear at the start of her book, that the advice we're discussing here is for those who feel safe in their relationships. Vulnerable conversations about gender roles and challenging those roles can set off an abusive partner. So if you've experienced domestic violence or think that may be a possibility, Mangino recommends talking to a therapist or reaching out to community resources that support survivors. Help is available through the National Domestic Violence Hotline. That's 1-800-799-7233 or online at thehotline.org. With that said, though, here's my conversation with Kate Mangino on Equal Partners. I've been doing gender work for about 20 years, and I always work with um, nonprofit organizations, and I work mostly overseas. And so for years, I was having wonderful, sophisticated conversations about gender and gender norms with communities in Indonesia and Zambia and Kenya. And then I would come home and have rather antiquated conversations about gender with my own community. And that became especially clear when I became a parent 11 years ago. I just had this one of those overwhelming days where just I felt the weight of the world on my shoulders. I was finishing a dissertation. I was teaching undergraduate classes. My kids were little at the time. I think they were two and five. And I was the, you know, the alpha parent, the parent who always got called when someone was sick or there was a day off of daycare or whatever. And I just had this meltdown my husband at the time was trying so hard to be understanding and kind. And he kept asking me, what do you want me to do to help? And I was working on a dissertation on the the intersection of women's empowerment and masculinities. So I had this literature review right on the tip of my tongue. And I said, I don't want you to help. That's part of the problem. I don't want to give you a list of things to do that doesn't ease my load. That doesn't make it any easier for me. And I started explaining to him how these behavior patterns in the United States and Canada, you know, how people in the women's role were were overburdened with household work and how that was preventing her to have professional, uh, reach professional ambition and how men were pushed into the income generation space. And that was preventing men from having closer relationships with kids. And I said, it makes me so sad. I'm working on this dissertation about gender and we're falling into those same patterns. And I, I want that to change. And so that night started this conversation that continues today, 11 years later, because it's not something you can just talk about once. It's, I think, an ongoing issue, but it really helped make me aware of sort of, I had the words because of my academic work to have that conversation with my partner. And I thought that's the book that I need to write is I want everyone to have the words and the data and the anecdotes and the stories so that they have the words when they need to address the issue in their own relationship. So who were some of the people you spoke to for this book? Not specifically per se, but what types of relationships and sources were you trying to look at? 
Well, I started with experts. So I was looking at practitioners who work in the NGO field and I was working, looking at academics to see what was out there. And then I, when I started to talk to sort of everyday people, I interviewed a lot of Gen Z, you know, young people who were just starting to partner because I wanted to see where they were, right? I'm a little bit older. I've been married for 16 years now. And I was wondering what, um, if anything had really changed in terms of expectations around partnership. The middle section of my book all revolves around interviews with 40 men who I nicknamed the EP40 because all 40 of them are equal partners. And these are men who are already equal partners in their home, which means they do half of the physical and cognitive labor in their household. And I just wanted to learn from them. Where did they come from? And what inspired and motivated them to do something different than what the average man does in his home and what the, you know, um, implications were, what did they get out of it? So that was, that was fascinating. All right. Well, let's get into the meat of things a little bit then. How do you define gender roles and what do they usually look like in our society? Gender roles are those unspoken, unwritten norms that we follow, the assumptions that we make about what girls do, what boys do, and that leads us into what we think women and men should do. And although the roles, they're cultural, they change over time, and they're not written down, they're just things that are handed down from generation to generation through role modeling. You know, no one sits you down and says, this is how I want you to be a woman. You just pick up cues throughout your life from your family, from your neighbors, from TV and media. For example, a lot of people have an assumption that boys are really energetic. Boys like to run around. Boys are more physical than girls. Girls are so emotional. Girls can sit down and can do quiet projects for longer periods of time. Uh, There's just a lot of assumptions in sort of how we behave because of our gender identity. And I argue, and a lot of other academics argue, that very little of that is biology, that most of it is behavioral. And it's taught, which means it can be untaught. So how does this usually play out at home? In your book, you lay them out as the female role and the male role. What's entailed in those? So just to give a quick clarification, the reason why I use the term female role and male role is because a lot of the work that's been done on this topic to date has been heteronormative. There's an assumption that you have a couple with, you know, one man and one woman that I wanted to be really inclusive. I wanted to include queer and same sex couples. And so I wanted to make sure that these were framed in terms of roles and behaviors and not linked to our gender identity. Also, I've heard from, since the book came out, I've heard from a lot of male readers who have a swapped situation in their household. And so men, they're saying, I'm the one who's the cognitive laborer. I'm the one doing the bulk of the work in the home. And my wife is the one that's more emotionally disconnected. So it's not as common, but um, I use the term male role and female role to be as inclusive as possible and to highlight the fact that you might be doing that female role, even though you don't identify as a woman. So what that role entails is the female role is going to be doing inside work and uh, everyday work. So cooking, cleaning, child care, elder care, washing, bathing kids, doing homework. It's those everyday relentless chores day in and day out that follow you on vacation and follow you into weekends. There's a very high level of cognitive labor. You're anticipating the needs of your family. You don't just have to cook dinner tonight, but you have to think about what you're going to make on Friday and are you meeting everyone's tastes and preferences and and dietary restrictions? Are you monitoring the calendar? When is the next day off of school and who's going to come and watch the kids? So that would be the female role. Male role tasks tend to be coded outdoor and intermittent. So uh, lawn and garden, car maintenance, fix it projects, balancing, you know, finances are often coded as male tasks. Those, there's a lot of them and it's definitely not nothing, but they're intermittent. They're not every single day. And if you miss, you know, a weekend of mowing the lawn, your neighbors might roll their eyes, but no one is going to be harmed for it. But if you miss a day or two of feeding your kids, it's going to be pretty noticeable. So it's a way to divide work, but it's definitely not close to parity. It's funny. I mean, that's certainly the example that I had growing up and the example that a lot of my extended family members and my friends had growing up too. How does this arrangement specifically impact the female role, I guess? It's just, it's a lot. So in my book specifically talks about people who both work. So both partners are in the economy, adding to family income, but yet that female role is still taking the bulk of the household work. It's just more than one person can handle. And we saw that really happen 
um, during the first COVID shutdowns, when all of the community support, the aftercare programs, the schools shut down, the camps, uh, the neighbors who would watch your kids once in a while, your in-laws, when when everyone was forced to go down to their nuclear family, we saw women just break under the stress because it was more than one person could could handle. There were just there was more work to do than there were hours in the day. Uh, the way that it can harm women, it can harm her professionally. She might not be able to reach professional or income goals, income generation goals, because that load at home is preventing her from putting her hat in the ring for a promotion or working overtime to get noticed by a manager, right? It can definitely harm her in an emotional wellness sense that you're just, you're not getting enough time for yourself. You're not getting enough sleep. You're not getting enough exercise. You're not taking care of your body. There's a lot of links to depression dissatisfaction in your relationship, pulling away from friends, pulling away from hobbies because you're just working so many hours every day to keep your household going. And eventually that can lead to physical problems because we know that poor emotional health can be manifested in the body as well. So over time, you can see some pretty significant, you know, detrimental effects that can, you know, even end up in divorce. Let's get into some tips then and how to go about moving the needle here. Starting, I guess, with new couples, couples without kids, how do you navigate that conversation? I think one great place to start is to also realize that gender inequality is also bad for men and bad for people of all genders. So when you approach someone with this topic or when you're having conversation with your friends and you're bringing it up, that you don't just talk about why it's bad for women, but you also talk about why it's bad for men. It pigeonholes men into that income generation role. So they might be you know, dissuaded from having those more deeper, meaningful relationships with kids and spouse. That can lead also that distancing, that feeling that you have to perform masculinity, you have to be the one who makes a certain amount of money, who's in charge, who's in control, who's fearless in the home. That can also lead to emotional wellness and physical problems in men. So I do think it's important to talk about why it's it can be bad for everyone. And then you know, getting down into more like specifics when you don't have kids, I think that's a great time to, there's less to do in the home because it's just the two of you. And so having really explicit conversations, do you think that whoever makes more money doesn't have to do as much in the household? Do you think that whoever works fewer hours doesn't have to do as much work at the home? Looking at your own patterns of behavior? Do you see a gendered pattern? Have we naturally fallen into that indoor-outdoor divide? Or are we following more our passions? You know, I have a passion for cooking, or I have a passion for keeping the house neat and tidy, or I have a passion for gardening. You know, playing into what we like to do as opposed to what we were raised to do. And then for those tasks in the house that neither of you like, maybe neither of you particularly like cooking or neither of you particularly like managing the schedule, trade off and on, you know, six months, six months or divide it by quarters or divide it by years. But make sure that if there's something that has to be done in the home that neither one of you likes, that you're dividing that equally as well. And for those with kids, how does that change the conversation? I think that households with kids, there's just, there's so much more to do. And I think one important thing to do is to start with both of you being very aware of all of the work that needs to be done. So uh, as Eve Brodsky puts it, she always says, you have to name the invisible. You have to make visible that invisible work. So all that cognitive labor, all that management of schedules, all of that anticipating of needs, talk about that and be really open about who's doing what and try to redelegate the cognitive labor just as much as the physical tasks. I'm thinking of those whose partners are maybe having trouble seeing the invisible as you were talking about. What do you do if you have a partner who doesn't see a need for things to change? I mean, it's going well for them. So maybe they think, you know, we're good where we are. Are there other people and parts of our lives that can have an impact on promoting equality at home? That is a hard space to be in. And so I I will never be flippant about um, someone in a relationship who is the cognitive laborer, who is doing the majority of the work and has a partner who is not willing to engage in that kind of a conversation. It's an extremely frustrating place to be. And I've talked to many women who have been married for 5, 10, 15 more years who have repeatedly had conversations with their partner and aren't getting anywhere. Therapy is always an option. I always suggest to have that conversation one more time by highlighting how it how gender inequality can be detrimental to men 
and that this isn't just about what you and I are doing in our home. It's not just about our two personalities, that we are part of a broader pattern that we're seeing in North America and that we're both falling into it, which is fine because it happens to a lot of us. It's not wrong. We're not bad. We haven't made any mistakes. We're just responding to our gendered upbringing. But if we're going to move closer to parity, we need to change things in our household. You know, there's also some deeper conversations about when you assume I'm going to do all of the work that's telling me implicitly that you don't care about me as much. You're not listening to me. You're not valuing my time. You're not valuing my work. And so having some of those deeper conversations and making sure that there's space for both of you to respond. So it's not just about why I'm feeling stressed and burdened, but ask your partner, are there any things that you're doing in our household or in our relationship that stress you out? What would you like to share with me? What invisible labor are you doing that you want to make visible? So it is not a one way, but it's creating the space for both of you to share your experience. Are there any other ways that I guess on a broader scale, we can promote gender equality at home, at work and in our communities even? I'm going to use a story to uh, give an example. I interviewed a man who lives in Vermont and several years ago, his wife is a physician and was making plenty of money for their family and they were stretched. They had two small children and what he determined and his, his wife determined is that they didn't need him to provide for his family in terms of money or material goods. What they needed is his care and his time. And he was quite happy to quit his job and be a full-time parent for a while. And they were excited about their decision and they could make it work financially. And so he left his job and became a stay-at-home dad, but his community was not supportive. His mother-in-law was very condescending and would you know, make remarks about him being lazy, not pulling his weight, um, suggesting that he just wanted, you know, more time off as if having two small kids in the house 24 seven wasn't a really hard job. And it was very gendered because she had a daughter who was a stay at home mother. But when her son-in-law chose to be a stay at home father, she, she didn't like that and made it very clear. They didn't have, you know, neighbors would sort of roll their eyes and and make snide comments. And so he said after about a year, he couldn't handle the negative feedback anymore. And he ended up going back to work. And he said, hindsight, looking back, he really regrets that because the best thing for his family would have been for him to stay home. And he let himself be pressured into going back to work because the community was not supportive of that decision. So I think that's a really good lesson to all of us, whether you're a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle or a neighbor or a sibling, that when someone tries to step out of traditional gender norms, be supportive, listen, be their ally, let them vent, help them troubleshoot, but be that person who says, I know what you're doing is a little bit different. And I know what you're doing isn't, you know, what has been done in the past, but I think it's the best decision for you and your family. And I'm here to support you hundred percent. And my book really focuses on social change, but I do have a bit in Uh, in the last chapter about what we could do for structural improvements, I think the number one thing where we could start would be um, a paid caregiving for all. So no matter who your employer, whether you're, you earn a wage or a salary that you have access to paid time off to care for a child, a family member, yourself, elder care. I think that would be a huge step in the right direction. And that when those policies are rolled out, that men are encouraged just as much to take time off to be caregivers for their families and their communities. Well, Kate, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. That was all the questions that I had for you off the top of my head here, but is there anything that I'm missing that you want our listeners to know? The only thing I might add is we haven't really touched on raising kids. I think that right now, sometimes our perception and our reality isn't quite aligned. And we are giving the illusion that we've reached equality when we all know in our individual households, we haven't. We still have this this statistic that the female role is handling twice as much work in the home as the male role. And I think what that implicitly sends our kids is boys are being raised to think that they get credit for half the work, but they only have to do a third. And we're implicitly raising girls to understand that they have to do two thirds of the work, but they only get credit for 50%. And I think that when we're all working collectively towards gender equality and policies that are going to promote all people equally, We need to sort of better align our perceptions and our realities 
So at the very least, if you have a household and you're doing, let's say you are in a partnership, a different sex partnership, and you're female and you know you're doing way more in the house than your male partner, and it's not going to change. Maybe you're okay with it. Maybe you're not, but you know that that's just how it is. I think the one thing we can do that would be incredibly helpful for the next generation is just to be honest with our children and to say, in our household, I do more work in the home. Dad does less. I wish it were a little bit different, but not every family does it this way. And just because of your gender identity doesn't mean that's going to link you with behaviors when you're an adult. And I think you can make your own choices when you grow up. I think having explicit conversations with our kids throughout their life would really prepare them to be equal partners in the future. Kate Mandrino is a gender expert who has spent 20 years working with international organizations to promote gender equality, women's empowerment, and healthy masculinity abroad. Her new book is Equal Partners, Improving Gender Equality at Home, out now from St. Martin's Press. If you like this conversation, be sure to join us next week. We'll speak with marriage and family therapist Vanessa Beaver about how to better communicate with your partner and how to foster healthier relationships in general. Kate, thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you so much. Colleges across the country are back in full swing, with many students returning to their most normal college environments since the coronavirus pandemic. These first few months are really exciting for first-year students especially, as you're making new friends and getting that first taste of independence. But many researchers and college counselors argue this period also comes with a higher risk of sexual assault. Over in western New York at the University at Buffalo, our next guests are knee-deep in a study about how women support and protect each other from unwanted sexual experiences particularly at college parties. Dr. Jennifer Reed is the chair of the university's psychology department, while Dr. Jennifer Livingston is an associate professor of nursing. They call their safety strategy capable guardianship. In other words, drawing up a specific plan with close friends to look out for one another. To be clear, in doing this research, Reed and Livingston say they're not trying to victim blame or place the burden of preventing sexual assault on survivors. There is a lot we need to do as a society to combat rape culture and hold perpetrators responsible. But in addition, their goal is to better understand environments where sexual assault is more prevalent and give students the tools they need to stay safe. We'll start with Livingston. There are these bystander interventions, and they had been used uh, in an effort to help reduce sexual assault risk on college campuses. But um, something that I think we both felt was missing a little bit was that these bystander interventions were really geared more toward the general social environment. So you teach people, oh, if you're at a party and you see somebody who seems to be at risk for sexual assault, you know, how would you act? And those are good things to know but they don't necessarily focus on the people who are most likely to know that somebody's in trouble, which is your friend, right? If you go out with your friends, you can see if there's somebody who's, you know, your friend is talking to somebody and she seems uncomfortable. Um, You notice if she's left the party, you notice if, um, you know, she seems to be in some kind of danger or somebody seems to be getting a little too close. So the intervention was designed in our minds to really target pairs of friends, The first thing we had this idea, but the first thing we did was we set out to do some focus groups and to see like, what do women think about this idea? Does it seem like it would be appealing? And so we developed a prototype intervention that we thought would be good. That was based on input from our collaborators and um, and our own ideas and our reviewing of the literature. Um, And then we taped it and we showed it to several focus groups of college women who came in. Um, And Jen just uh, was the lead author on a paper that sort of summarized those findings. So I'll let her talk about that. But that was our first step. Yeah. In talking to them through, you know, these focus group interviews, a lot of them indicated like, you know, we do this, but we don't necessarily always plan it in advance or sometimes things go wrong. You know, if somebody gets too drunk, then they don't want to leave with the rest of us or, um, you know, so we found that friends were well positioned to do this but there was room for improvement. They also, so that women really liked the idea of participating with a friend. They really liked the idea of capitalizing on their friendship. They did talk quite a bit about alcohol and how alcohol can interfere with their ability to recognize 
or that they would, you know, go their own way and not necessarily like they'd be pursuing their own conversations or whatever. I might not necessarily notice that their friend is having a hard time. And some of the women I even talked about, though, that they thought drinking would make them more likely to intervene, that it would give them kind of liquid courage to go ahead and intervene in a situation. When we asked them what they thought about this style of intervention, they liked that it was customizable. We weren't telling them like, don't drink. We made it really clear. We're not blaming women for their sexual assaults. But what we want to do is empower them with tools so they can still go out and do the things they like to do and be in the social settings they like to be in, but that they can do it safely. So it's great that it's customizable. Just so we can get a better picture, though, what are some examples of what good, capable guardianship looks like? What are some of the ways you see friends stepping in or planning ahead? One of the things that we do in the intervention is we give them this like very long list of all of the things, we call them assault protective behaviors that you might do um, in order to reduce the likelihood of assault. And it includes things like maybe you would watch your drink or watch out for how much you're drinking, how much your friend's drinking, but it's not just those things. So it also includes things like being drawn away from your friend group, accepting a ride home from somebody that you don't know very well, you know, not letting people know where you're going to be, um, you know, being around people. And this is sometimes harder to know, uh, but, you know, do they either have kind of reputation for having not just perpetrating, that's a hard thing to know, but just generally having like a uh, hostile or derogatory attitudes toward women. There's a whole bunch of these things. And so we give women this big, long list um, and we say, like, what do you think of this list? What do you think of some of these things that um, that you might do, which of these do you think you could really envision implementing in your own life? And one of the things that we have heard from women is a initially they're freaked out because this list is so long and they think, oh my gosh, except that they're already doing a lot of the things. Um, and so I think one thing that for them is empowering um, and, and really enhances their sense of confidence is a lot of this you're already doing. So what we're doing is taking, what are you already doing? Thinking, are there a few other of these things that you might do that when you guys go out, you might say, hey, you know what? Let's just make an agreement when we go out, we're going to keep track of each other. Or if I am, you know, intending, you know, I think I'm going to hook up tonight. I'm just going to let you know, or I'm going to, I'm, it's going to be okay with me if you ask like, Hey, are you into this guy or not into this guy? I won't get upset about that. So like all of these like small things that you make a commitment to do it. And then you make a plan for following through. And then as Dr. Livingston is saying, um, you know, you think about what might the influence of alcohol be on, on those things. What we're trying to do is to get women to think about, you know, from this list of things you might do, which of them do you think you're already doing that maybe you could strengthen your commitment to those things or refine how you're executing those things? And are there things that are new that you hadn't tried before, but that maybe you could take on? I'm thinking to my own time in college, specifically for those first couple of semesters. And I guess I'm wondering what advice you might have for students in those early, early days. Because at that point, everything's sort of nebulous. You're just getting to know everybody. And those first friend groups you form might not ultimately stick together. How do you know when you've got a good partner on this front? That's a great question. And it's actually something that we're trying to figure out now. We're working on another grant to extend the work that we've already done, to test it on a larger scale, and then also to think about when is the best time to do this? Um, the first college year is when women are at greatest risk for sexual assault. So then that would make sense to do an intervention then at the same time as you're saying, you know, there's a lot of change in that first semester in terms of who you're hanging out with, even, you know, across from the beginning of the semester, or the end of the semester, your friends change pretty rapidly. So one of the things that we would really like to do is to figure out, like, when is the best time to do this? When are you going to maximize the strength of that friendship? I think we do expect some generalization of these skills. So I don't know that it all hinges just on this one friend pair. We use the friend pair to get a conversation going about risk context. But I don't think, we hope, that if that friend pair isn't together, that it all falls apart. I think our hope is that these are skills that you learn and that maybe you'd be able to generalize, but we don't know that for sure yet. And some of the women who have participated in our developmental work have said, you know, geez, I think I can also use this when I'm out with other friends. Or there was one woman who was during the, a break in the focus group. I heard her talking in the hall to other participants going, when I get home, I'm getting all my friends together and we're going to talk. So there's definitely, I think, opportunities for this to generalize beyond that pair. But right now, just to, to keep things kind of manageable as we're developing this and to be able to test the effects and stuff, we're just focusing on diets. 
Dr. Jennifer Reed is chair of the Department of Psychology at the University at Buffalo, while Dr. Jennifer Livingston is an associate professor at the university's nursing school. Together, they're studying the ways women protect themselves on college campuses. Thanks again. Thanks for thinking to invite us. Yes, we really appreciate it. That's a wrap on this week's 51%. 51% is a national production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio in Albany, New York. It's produced by me, Jesse King. Our executive producer is Dr. Ellen Shartok, and our theme is Lolita by the Albany-based artist Girl Blue. Thanks again to our guests this week, Kate Mangino, Dr. Jennifer Reed, and Dr. Jennifer Livingston. To learn more about our guests and the topics discussed on this show, check us out at wamcpodcast.org. There we have links to everything you'll need and episodes new and old, which you can also find wherever you get your podcasts. Until next week, I'm Jesse King for 51%. I was every single girl. I was nobody else. I was so sure of myself. I was 15 and a half. He was a hollow laugh And I lost my cool Somewhere along the way A nightmare down the hallway I had to learn how to look away I lost my cool Take it. Sit down.